How's it going, everyone? What's going on? It's Kyle Henderson along with Ty Hayes coming to you from beautiful Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Today, we're talking the college football playoff rankings. Ty, let's just jump right into it. When you look to uh, the rankings, I'm going to bring them up on the screen right here. Um, I mean, there's a lot to digest uh, because you have a one loss team in Ohio State who recently lost to Michigan. Um, they're they're put at number six and Alabama stays at number eight. Your initial thoughts on uh, where these teams are ranked. And uh, I appreciate you guys all joining. Hit the thumbs up like subscribe we're just jumping right into it ty go ahead yeah guys be sure to hit that like button massive for content creators like us and mm -hmm. kyle is the standard in the space <laughs> and so you have got to support him first and foremost it's just good content now let's let's dive into this for those of you that know me kyle i think i've told you this i i love the show it's always sunny in philadelphia and when i saw this i thought of dennis and his iconic moment mm -hmm. where he says i am untethered and my rage knows no bounds mm -hmm. i understand there are going to be people coming in here saying these rankings still don't matter because there's conference championship mm -hmm. and while i agree it will take care of itself my counterpoint to that would be why are we okay with the committee doing a bad job until they have to do a good job? Shouldn't the standard be do a good job the entire time? Mm -hmm. How in the world? I already had my beef with Oregon yeah. being over Alabama. Mm -hmm. How in the world is Ohio State over Alabama? They sure. don't even have the argument of Oregon where they've been kicking teens teeth in. At least yeah. Oregon can say, well, we've beaten the hell out of all mm -hmm. these teams. Mm -hmm. Ohio State has struggled Kyle, they lost to their rival when Jim Harbaugh wasn't on the field. How mm -hmm. in the world can you remain above Texas and Alabama when you lost your biggest game and the opposing head coach wasn't on the field? Doesn't that have to mean something? Like, doesn't that inherently mean you need to fall out the top 10? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I was irate when I saw these committee rankings. I can't wait to hear your opinion. Yeah, I mean, uh, here's Ohio State's uh, resume, and I'll go ahead and read it out. 11 and 1, 8 and 1 in the Big Ten, number 37 uh, total offense, number three total defense. And I think when we've talked about this before, I mean, the, the committee certainly likes the style points and listening to Boo Corrigan uh, following the committee last night. I mean, uh, they're going to have a really difficult time ranking these six, seven, and eights. I don't think they even know where to rank these or how to rank these one-loss teams. I do know that, in my mind, the Pac-12 has certainly punched their ticket. We have the resumes brought up on here. We're going to talk about the playoff ranking, so I appreciate you guys being in here. Uh, with Ohio State, as you can see on the bottom left, they lost to number two, Michigan. They beat number 10, Penn State, and they beat number 17, Notre Dame. So they're two and one versus tw top 25 that are in the college football playoff rankings. The number 41 overall strength Strength of schedule. Clearly, they have elite weapons, but there are four thousand odds to win the college football title, and I think that tells you where the college football um, odds makers put this team. Right? Um, they will not play for a conference title, so they're that one lost team on the outside looking in. Depending on what happens with Michigan and Iowa, we're going to talk about each of those teams here coming up. I think. If you lose late in the college football season, you should be heavily penalized. Um, it doesn't matter the rivalry game. Can you imagine if Alabama would have lost to Auburn, where that would have put them, right? You have to win uh, these type of rivalry games. It's just kind of survive in advance. And I get it. There's other teams that have put up some style points. But why wasn't Washington penalized for their three-point win over Washington State? Why wasn't Washington penalized for their narrow win over Oregon State, right? You see what I'm saying? Like, why is Alabama held to a different standard? And the reason that I bring that up is because I look at a team like Florida State, right? Florida State, for example, they were trailing 13-0 to North Alabama. No, I'm not going to stop talking about that because it's very important that Alabama is being held at a different standard and it's unfair to Alabama Crimson Tide. Look, if Alabama was down 13-0 to Chattanooga, you know that Alabama would have been out of the playoff race 100%. You know that if Alabama would have lost to Auburn, they would have been out 100%, right? So why is Alabama being held out at a different standard? I don't get it. Um, but the the fact of the matter is we have the SEC title, a.k.a. our early look at the national title game. In my mind, I still think that two teams from the SEC get into the national that they that not only do they get into the playoffs, but they somehow figure out to play once again for the title at NRG. Now, look, I think that Alabama and Georgia have played a gauntlet of a schedule. The SEC are where the teams are. At. And listen, who did Kentucky just beat? And what 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 division is Kentucky in, Ty? Kentucky is in the SEC, and they and took out, and convincingly so, Louisville. 
Exactly. So when Louisville beats Florida State or when that game goes into double overtime or whatever, look, Tate Rotomaker, he's a serviceable quarterback, but he's not Jordan Travis. Even on the committee, they said it's not the same type of team. My thoughts and prayers are with Jordan Travis. Absolute baller, right? Like he, like for for that to happen to him is devastating. Same thing with any of these elite college football players, but they are not the same team. Plus, on top of that, even with him, they don't have the resume overall. Who they're 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 living off the one law, the one win against LSU. So, um, you know, Alabama knows right now that they have to beat Georgia. We all know that, and I'm still curious if with that win over number one, what if the committee does the right thing they got to put them in um but yeah that's kind of just my you know hot take let's let's uh kind of switch gears here ty and talk about um you know some of these uh the records versus the top 25 teams and these are the the records uh off the top 25 of the latest college football playoff rankings i'm going to put that on the screen now for you to look at ty you can c- go ahead and read those out yeah so you have alabama at three and one they've beat old miss they beat lsu beat tennessee three really good wins especially if you focus in on old miss lsu fantastic wins and if we're talking quality losses they have an incredibly quality loss. Look, I'm not going to lie to you. I put more stock in a loss to Texas with Steve Sarkeesian, Bo Davis, PK, mm-hmm. than Oregon's loss to Washington. Mm-hmm. Because Washington hasn't looked that great anyways, and Oregon's been beating up on Bishop Sycamore. I yeah. digress. Mm-hmm. We go to Florida State. One big win. They beat number 13 LSU. Good win. Jordan Travis isn't there anymore. And I have serious doubts they take down Louisville. We'll talk about that at a later date. You have Georgia. Nothing to take away from Georgia's resume, ladies and gentlemen. Beat Old Miss, good win. Beat Tennessee, solid win. I think that Tennessee is a little bit disappointing this year, but they were solid in other areas. They beat Missouri. We can't Mm -hmm. take anything away from that. Michigan, they beat up on a bunch of Bishop Sycamores. They beat up on Penn State, and they beat up on Ohio State. How Ohio State, once again, I hate to beat a dead horse, how do you lose to your rival without their head coach and you get rewarded for it? Bama is penalized, Mm -hmm. penalized for a close win against USF. Mark my words, Bama's biggest deterrent right now in the committee's eyes is a win against USF, but somehow Mm -hmm. Ohio State is propped up for a loss against Michigan. We then look at Oregon. They're one and one. They beat Oregon State. Good win. That's a rivalry game. I grant you that, but you lost to Washington. You beat up on Utah, who isn't that great because they Mm -hmm. have everything gone. Mm -hmm. You have Texas. They beat Alabama. They lost to Oklahoma. They do have a win, though, against not only Alabama, Kansas State, who comes in at number 25. If I'm not mistaken, Washington right now, Texas, Alabama, and Georgia have the most ranked wins. We go to Washington, 2-0. They beat Oregon, beat Oregon State, but... Kyle, do you like Washington's chance rematching against Oregon? And then I have a question for you. Oregon beats Washington. Louisville beats Florida State. Bama downs Georgia. Texas wins their conference championship game. What happens? (laughs) <laughs> total chaos um and greg we will update that as uh florida state does have a win i guess if clemson clemson is in the top 25 i guess they are um i'll look at the graphic right now we need to update that because that would be another win uh for florida state yeah clemson's number 23 so we will update that they have a uh, two and zero in uh um top 25 and i think the thing with that game it was in overtime and the thing about it is Clemson had the opportunity in that late game to win that game, right? So uh, Clemson has been one of those teams that hasn't had the type of season that they've had in the past, but they've been able to win some some games uh, for Debo Sweeney. And, of course, uh, that game, Florida State won in Clemson. Uh, I, I definitely will add that. Um, look, I, I think if there are some one-loss scenarios, uh, clearly this team, th- this committee loves the fact that, uh, you know, the, these head-to-head wins, right? So they're going to certainly value these head-to-head wins. So the Texas win, if Texas is able to beat Oklahoma State, uh, they're going to value that win that head-to-head over Alabama because they beat Alabama, and rightfully so, in Tuscaloosa, right? However, with that said, uh, if Alabama is able to beat Georgia, this type of Georgia team, then what happens with the Georgia Bulldogs? Are they out? I think if you look to the All-State playoff predictor, um, that scenario would fall out. But when you look to Georgia's overall resume, um, it might come down to Georgia or Texas. But then they could say, well, since uh, Texas beat Alabama, then therefore they are better than Georgia, right? They might do something like that. Kirby Smart just recently said, 
this is not the same Alabama team. Nobody is at this point of the season, right? All these teams have transforms. And I think if you put, um, if you look to kind of future odds and you kind of match up Alabama versus Texas, I, I promise you, Tex- Alabama is going to be the favorite against Texas right now if they were able to play this coming weekend. So, um, and that's the other thing that I have is like you have like Washington and Oregon. If Washington is so good, then why have they been the underdogs the last two weeks, right? They were the underdog against Oregon State and they're the underdog again against um Oregon. So these one loss teams are certainly going to cause a headache in the playoffs. I don't know how they're going to rank them, but I know it's going to be very difficult to leave an Alabama team out if they're able to beat the number one ranked Georgia Bulldogs. By the way, that SEC title game is in the home state 40 minutes away from Athens, Georgia. So it's basically a home field game for the Georgia Bulldogs, even though people refer to it as Brian Denny East. Still, the facts remain. It's only 45 minutes away from Athens. Let's like a, let's take a look at Oregon, okay? Because this is a team that I don't understand why these guys are even ranked above, um, you know, I guess even an Ohio State, a Bama, even a Texas, you know, who we're tar- starting to talk about. But when you look to Oregon's resume, uh, Ty, read it out, and let's kind of get some feedback inside the comment box uh, about Oregon as well. Yeah, they're on a six-game win streak. Those win include, like I said earlier, Bishop Sycamore, Gainesville High School, and if I'm not mistaken, Decatur High School. They have an 11-1 <laughs> record. They're 8-1 and one in the Pac-12. They lost to number three, Washington. They beat number 20, Oregon State, 1-1 one and one against top 25. They do have a really good offense. I grant them that. They have a good defense. But look at their strength of schedule coming in at number 59. They would be favored over Washington. And I know everybody likes Bo Nix for Heisman. Guys, Jaden Daniels should win the Heisman. Jaden Daniels has more touchdowns on throws over 20 yards than Bo Nix has completions on throws of 20 yards. Mm -hmm. They are not the same. Jaden Daniels is your Heisman. But this is ridiculous, Kyle. How Mm -hmm. are they ahead of... Alabama, how are they ahead of Texas? I'll put it like this. If you told me right now, Oregon versus Alabama, Oregon versus Texas, I'm taking Texas in that game and I'm taking Alabama in that game. Yeah, I, I am too. You know, and, and you look to this game against uh, Washington on Friday night, uh, they're a nine point favorite against Washington. So, Oregon, the thing about them is they are certainly hot. And this is a team that is playing at a high level in terms of the offensive side. I do not think that they have the defense, and I get it, the number 15 overall defense as of right now. But when you look to their uh, overall quality of, of schedule, I mean, it's just not the same as some of these other conferences. Same thing with the, the ACC. Um, I, I just don't believe in the Pac 12 overall. And, and I say this because they got a lot of hype from their win over Colorado. I'm going to say that again and again. I mean, all the spotlight was on could a 3-0 and Colorado team that was ranked number 19 at the time beat Oregon? Of course not. And Oregon got a lot of style points from that victory because they beat them, what, was it 42-7 to or something like that? So yeah. um, when you look to the fact that they're 1-1 one one against top 25s, they, have, uh, they, they beat Oregon State. And they lost to Washington. Now, more than likely, what's going to happen is the Pac-12, in my opinion, has already punched their playoff ticket. This committee really, really likes this Oregon team. They continue to hype on the fact that um, they have a big offense, that they've been able to uh, perform at a high level down the stretch against lower competition, at least in my opinion. Um, So I think if Washington wins and they finish 13-0, and they're absolutely in. And if uh, Oregon's able to win and they finish out 12 and one in the Pac-12 champs, they are one million percent in as well. So I look at the Pac-12 champ as certainly that that's probably the only conference right now, as of this very moment, that has a team inside uh, the playoff rankings, 100 percent. Because I'm going to tell you why. So you have Michigan, okay? And we're going to bring up Michigan's schedule next. Um, we'll take a quick look at Washington's, but you know, Washington's, uh, they're undefeated. And as I said, they're already a, a team inside the playoffs, in my opinion, th- them or Oregon. 12 game win streak, 9 and 0 in Pac 12 play. Um, number 12 overall offense, number 93 overall defense, uh, beat number five, Oregon, beat number 20, Oregon State, two and zero against top 25, number 23, strength of schedule. The play of Michael Penix has been amazing. Um, they're a nine point underdog against Oregon, which is strange. They were, I think, like a four point underdog against Oregon State as well. Um, they won their last two games by uh, a small margin. I, I, I combined five points. They had to kick a field goal uh, to beat, um, who was it? Washington State. I get it's a rivalry game. Alabama had to throw a 31 yard pass for a touchdown. So, um, but still is like, how are you playing at the back end of the season? I think that certainly matters, but maybe you can watch out those rivalry games. Overall, why are they a nine point underdog in this team is what ranked number three or number four, wherever they are in the country. I just, I don't get it, but let's look at uh, Michigan because Michigan is a 23 point. I didn't even put, 
I, I wouldn't put a resume for <laughs> Iowa together. Um, but but this team right here, Ty, uh, Michigan, let's talk about Michigan. Why don't you go ahead and read out their resume? Yeah, they're on a 12-game win streak. They have the number 57 offense, solid defense coming in at number two. They beat Ohio State. They beat Penn State. They have the number th- 53 strength of schedule, so not great. They're 2-0 and versus top 25. You have all the sign-stealing ag- allegations. You have Burger Gate to open up the year. Mm-hmm. J.J. McCarthy has been solid, but I don't think he's a quarterback that just strikes fear into mm-hmm. the heart of opposing defenses. They're a massive favorite over Iowa. Part of that's because I don't think that they even know the concept of offensive football in Iowa. I don't think that that's hit the state yet. We'll mm-hmm. check in next year to see if that's a new development in Iowa They have solid odds to win the college football title. So Michigan is an interesting team to look at, and Mm -hmm. Iowa is not going to stand in their way just because I I don't think Iowa can score if they prayed as hard as they could that they need to touch. It's not happening. They just don't know Mm -hmm. what to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I think that um, when you look to Michigan, uh, people wanted to see if they could beat Ohio State, and they did, and that was a rivalry game, and it came down to really the final possession. There was an interception which ended the game. Um, I was curious to see where – Ohio State would fall, and the committee put them at number six. They were previously number two. I was kind of curious, too, if they were going to leapfrog Michigan over Georgia just because, you know, you're beating the number two team. Uh, When you look to Michigan's overall resume, um, outside of the Ohio State win, they do have the win over Penn State. Um, I will say that some of the throws that J.J. McCarthy did make in that game, they were just part of that rivalry game, right? Like uh, the way he was able to thread the ball, throw a couple defenders, throwing on the run. He made a couple good throws. Good for him. Uh, Blake Corum, he's a really good running back. This team is built on the run. Um, I still think all the stuff with uh, the allegations, I mean, that's that we don't even talk about that anymore. And the three game suspension was kind of a slap on the wrist. You see the uh, linebacker coach harping on, uh, you know, Twitter saying that he had no idea, no involvement. He's just basically been whitelisted from kind of space. Like people don't even pay attention to him anymore. Um, Going into this game, this is interesting. So they're a 23 and a half point favorite against Iowa. And in Iowa, they're lucky to score, what, eight points a game or whatever. Um, And I don't know. I mean, I still like you have to beat Iowa just like Alabama has to beat Georgia, just like Georgia has to beat Alabama. I mean, who knows the, the, the big 10 title game. This is probably, you know, the, the biggest point spread out of them all. Um, there's probably a, a low, low percentage that I was able to beat Michigan, but who knows? I mean, sometimes this Michigan team that, you know, that is, is Harbaugh back for this game or is he out for this game? Todd, do we know that? No, I believe he's out for this game. So he's out for the remainder of this game, but can he come back for the playoffs? Do we know that? I don't know that. I okay. believe he's right. able to come back for playoffs, if I'm not mistaken, because he was out for Maryland. He was out for yeah. Ohio State. Okay. He'd be out for this one. Okay. He, was he out for a game? It's a four-game suspension. So yeah. we'll see. Okay. Oh, so it's a, if it's a four-game suspension, yeah, then he's out of this game as well. Okay, so taking on Iowa, I mean, who knows about this game? I mean, I still – I. I think Michigan, you know, wins, but who knows? I mean, these Big Ten games, I mean, Michigan is known to uh, crap the bed, you know, in the back end. But, you know, if this team wins, then they are certainly in. So now we've had the Pac-12 in, uh, the winner of that game, certainly in. Then you have Michigan, if they win, they're certainly in. You have two spots. Um, let's uh, let's kind of go over Florida State again. And, and Florida State is a team that is without, you know, one of the best players in all of college football now. And Jordan Travis, he went out against North Alabama in a game that they were losing 13 to 0 with him in the game, mind you. They've won 12 and 0. The story of uh, Florida State has really been impressive because uh, Mike Norvell's done a great job. I mean, the last time that they played Alabama way back in 2017, that completely derailed their program. I mean, they almost had to drop down a division um, from FBS. Honestly, like things were getting really bad for them. And then uh, they've had a couple of coaching changes and now they're back and people are excited about it. Um, they're a two and a half point favorite against Louisville. They were able to gut out a win against Florida. Um, before that, they were able to, you know, come back and score 58 unanswered under a backup quarterback. But I think when you look to this team, and Bo Corrigan said this last night in the transcript, uh, he said, this is not the same team clearly with Florida State. And I'm asking you this, Ty, okay? If they are not the same team, if he admitted that, and they they find a way to win, and they're 13-0, and zero, but we clearly all know collectively that they are not the same team, then doesn't that mean that they are not one of the top four teams in college football? I would take that to mean that they are not one of the top four teams in college football. And let's understand this, Kyle, you you hit the nail on the head. 
the committee is after the best four teams. Yes. Heather Dinich cleared this up last night where she was like, no, we're not after the four most deserving teams. Mm -hmm. We're after the four best teams. Now, ultimately deserving and best. There is like a sectionality where they definitely intertwine, mm -hmm. but not always. Right. And mm -hmm. I think Florida state is the name to watch because you're hundred percent right. Kyle, this is a good team. It's mm -hmm. a really good team. Do I think this is one of the four best teams in the nation without Jordan Travis? Personally, no. Mm -hmm. I had questions as to whether they were one of the four best teams with Jordan Travis. Mm -hmm. I thought they were a yes. great team. Great point. Mm -hmm. But I thought they were like maybe six to seven, right? I thought that's mm -hmm. outside looking in. Now, if we're after the four best teams, no. Jordan Travis was one of the biggest names in college football for a reason. A mm -hmm. unbelievable catalyst for that offense. Now mm -hmm. they're without it. I don't care what they did against North Alabama. It's North Alabama. Mm -hmm. You should boat race them off principle alone. Mm -hmm. I completely agree with you. I think there is a scenario where if the committee is going after the four best teams, Florida State could get left out. Now, I think Louisville will take care of business so we don't even have to get to this point personally. Mm -hmm. I think when you look to this game, I mean, I, I think Louisville wins this game, to be honest. Um but I think that Florida State, they're fighting for Jordan Travis. Uh, Mike Norvell is going to get this team riled up. And I honestly think that at the end of the day, a 13-0 and zero Florida State team does not get in. I'm just going to say that. Um, I don't think that they have the resume overall. And they did beat uh, Clemson as well. So we have updated that. They are 2-0 and o against top 25 teams. Um, but I, I just think, you know, from a resume standpoint, I just and, and specifically without Jordan Travis and I get it, you can't penalize the entire team, but this team is not the same team without him in. So um, great season. It's unfortunate that he went out, but I just don't see even a 13 and zero Florida State team getting in um, over some of these uh, higher powered one loss teams, specifically in Alabama or even let's talk about this team. Texas. So uh, Texas right here, as you can see, they are on a six game winning streak, 11 and one um, overall, eight and one in the Big 12, number 14 offense, number 27 defense. Uh, their first uh, 10 game winning season since 2009. The job that Steve Sarkeesian is the job that people wanted him to do when they brought him in. I mean, he was kind of that. Um, I think, you know, Texas A&M had aspirations for Jimbo Fisher to do that. Same thing with Mike Elko. Um, you know, there's some they, they want these teams to ultimately compete in the playoffs and for a national cha championship. And Steve Sarkeesian, what he's been able to do over there at Texas has been really impressive. He's built up a, a team that um, is certainly formidable that came into Tuscaloosa and had the big victory. And who knows, could that be the ultimate game that boxes out Alabama out of the playoffs? I, I don't know. I, I, we're, we're about to see. Um, the number one strength of schedule overall on Power Guru, and they're living off that win against Alabama, and um, they lost to number 12 Oklahoma. The crazy thing about the Big 12 is that they were supposed – there was a really good shot if Oklahoma and Texas were going to rematch in the Big 12 title game. So Oklahoma State is getting completely drubbed by BYU. And you're like, okay, perfect. Oklahoma's trending in the right – you know, at the right time, right direction. They're back. And they win their game, okay? So they had the same record as Oklahoma State if they would have lost. Well, Oklahoma State comes back in like triple overtime and beats BYU. So in the title game, in the Big 12, you have Texas taking on Oklahoma State. And as you can see, they're a 14 uh, and a half point favorite against uh, the Cowboys. What's your thought on Texas overall? I mean, does this team have a, a better resume than an undefeated Florida State? And, and is this team um, overall, do they have a better resume than Oregon, Ty? Uh, I think they have a better resume than both. Right. And look, losses matter. There's no question about that. But I also think that we need to, I, I think losses come with nuance, Kyle. And mm -hmm. the Red River rivalry, the Red River shootout, as I grew up with it, it's one of the top three rivalries in all of college football, right? It's Iron Bowl, it's Red River rivalry, and then it's the big game in that order, in my opinion. Iron Bowl is the best, but then we get into that. Texas beat Alabama. That's better than any win Oregon has. It's better than any win Florida State has. And they beat them at home. I know different Alabama team, but then Texas mm. beat Kansas State. If they beat yep. Oklahoma State, they will have as many ranked wins as a Washington, mm -hmm. as a, more than an Oregon. So mm -hmm. yeah, I think they have a more impressive resume than both Oregon and a Florida State. As we sit here, they beat Alabama, which is more than Oregon or Florida State can say in terms mm -hmm. of a quality of opponent beat. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, they, they have a better resume even with the loss than Florida State does undefeated. To mm-hmm. your point, Florida State very easily could get left out of this situation undefeated, yeah. which would mm-hmm. be wild. Yeah. Uh, DeMarco with the super chat. I appreciate it, man. DeMarco's uh, been a longtime follower. Go ahead and read that out, Ty. He says, hey, Kyle, assuming we beat UGA in Texas slash FSU lose, where does that put Alabama? If Alabama beats UGA, I think the committee will keep number one Michigan, right, just because they, yeah. they're loving what they do. Yeah. I even think it's possible that Oregon – would be number two just because mm-hmm. the committee's love yes. for Oregon. I think uh, Alabama would probably come in number three, and I think Georgia would be four. Mm-hmm. If Texas yeah. and FSU lose, I think Georgia would come in at number four. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, I'm kind of looking. If Alabama is able to beat Georgia, I kind of ha- I have them slotted at the number three or the number four spot. Um, and l- listen. You, everybody's forgot about that sign stealing, right? Everybody, can you imagine if Alabama's paired up with Michigan? And guess who will be back for the playoffs? That's Jim Harbaugh. So um, the, the amazing thing about that would be, so you have all that sign stealing would go away. Could you imagine, Ty, if Alabama gets paired up with Michigan at a one through four? I know we're talking rat poison here because Michigan has to win and so does Alabama, but still, um, that would be something that we all harp on. The last time the two teams played um, was in the uh, Citrus Bowl. It was crazy because um, since I've covered Alabama, I, I you know mostly covered uh, you know playoff games, and last year uh, it was a, still a New Year's Six game with them playing in um, the the Big Easy. But you know when I went down the Citrus Bowl, it was Harbaugh versus uh, Nick Saban, and at that time Josh Gaddis, who was the former wide receiver coach, was the OC for Michigan, and that was led by Mac Jones. That was kind of the the changing of the torch for that, and uh, Alabama was able to come out. Uh, with a W down in Orlando, but who knows? I, I don't know. I would love to see Alabama and Michigan because uh, I think Alabama is a team that is built to stop the run, even though they, they did allow 244 against uh, Auburn and Hugh Freeze, but that game's all voodoo. Okay, uh, let's talk about uh, the Georgia Bulldogs. Uh, the Georgia Bulldogs, and then we're going to compare uh, side-by-side Alabama and Georgia, but let's just look at Georgia's resume for a second. 29-game um, win streak. Longest in college football, uh, number six total offense, number nine total defense, beat number 11 Ole Miss, beat number 21 Tennessee, beat number nine Missouri. So the, the front end of their schedule was laughable. I mean, these guys played absolutely nobody. And uh, the back end, though, was pretty impressive. Them beating Ole Miss, uh, Tennessee, Missouri. Um, now, the last game against Georgia Tech, who knows, if that's a rivalry game, whatever. Um, I, they you know were able to beat Georgia Tech, and I know a couple of players didn't play. But when you look to, to to things overall, I mean, this Georgia team clearly has uh, the best resume in college football up to this point, in my opinion. I think three and zero against top twenty-five is certainly impressive. And then we're going to compare Alabama and Georgia side by side, and you'll see why um, this team is the team. So, uh, what do you think about uh, Georgia's resume here, Ty? Couldn't agree more with you, man. I could not agree more with you. I think they have the best resume in college football. They have not only the three and O versus top twenty-five, two and O versus top fifteen. Mm -hmm. Missouri's a really good team this year, man. Missouri would catch a lot of people and surprise them. I'll put it like this. Go put Missouri in the pack. Watch what they do out there. (laughs) And the same with Ole Miss, man. Those are two quality wins. Mm -hmm. This is a really good resume. And what I do like, Kyle, is look at the balance in their offense and defense. And Mm -hmm. I think that's the word I have for this team. They're balanced. Mm -hmm. Very balanced. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is a balanced team, 100%. And I think that when you pair it against Alabama's, and we're going to put them side by side so everybody can see the actual numbers side by side, but um, Alabama riding a 10-game win streak, 8-0 and in SEC play, beat number uh, 11 Ole Miss, LSU, Tennessee, lost to Texas, so they're 3-1 and one against top 25 teams, number 48 offense, number 17 defense, number 17 strength to schedule on power guru, um, led by Milro. I mean, it's been really incredible to see um, how he's been able to take over games. And I honestly think it's kind of a, a disservice to college football, the way that they do the Heisman Trophy, because in my opinion, I think what we're about to see from Jalen Milro in the next three games is going to be something that you haven't seen all this season. I think he's about to go monster mode. He has to. And 
everything is going to rely on the play of him, to be honest. So um, he's going to have an incredible opportunity to silence even more critics in this next game. His overall play, you're about to see it go through the roof. How could it not? I mean, you saw his performance against Auburn uh, besides, you know, him throwing over the line of scrimmage, which are things that he just has to have better field awareness on. Um, I mean, the guy is just such an incredible athlete. He said he's over 200 and what, 30 pounds or something like that. So this is a big man and uh, he's uh, he's coming in with a lot of momentum and I think still with a chip on his shoulder. What, what's your take on Bama's resume, Ty? I think Bama has a fantastic resume. That loss to Texas, here's what people need to understand. They lost early. And mm. I think it kind of coincides with a number I want to talk about real fast. And that's that number 48 offense because that's a little bit misleading here. Mm. Bama's offense was not good for about the first three to four weeks. They yeah. started figuring yes. it out in week four. Mm. But really, since about week six to now, we're talking about a totally different Alabama offense. Yep. A to Alabama's offense is better than the 48th best offense in the nation. We have to remember, though, that takes the entire season into account. But w the way they're playing right now, this is one of the most dangerous offenses in the nation. And Kirby Smart, in fairness, they realize what it is. I don't know if y'all heard Kirby Smart's press conference, but someone tried to be like, oh, well, what'd you think about Alabama barely getting out of Auburn? And he yeah. stopped them and said, I don't want to hear anything about Auburn. Mm -hmm. I, we played them. I know all about Auburn. Mm -hmm. that, that means nothing to me. Because mm -hmm. to your point, Kyle, Auburn put up over 200 yards on the ground against Alabama. They did that against Georgia, too. I mean, this is an Auburn team that whenever, for whatever reason, they decide to show up whenever they choose to and put up big numbers. Milrow will be the catalyst. Yeah. And Milrow is different than any quarterback they have seen. He's mm -hmm. 230 pounds and moves like a cat. Mm -hmm. uh, he's got Lamar Jackson-esque speed. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's a different type of athleticism that we've seen. And you hit the nail on the head, man. He is peaking at the absolute right time, which is why I kind of wanted to dive into that offensive rank because I think that's a little bit misleading. I think Alabama's offense is far better than the number 48 in the nation just off, the, off of how they're playing now. Hey, uh, fam, by the way, uh, I got some new uh, gear that I'm about to drop. Uh, here's a kind of a preview mm -hmm. of a graphic that uh, I created. Let me see if I can get this up. So, um, you know, we've been going back and forth about the fourth and 31 tie and what people want to call it and stuff like that. And uh, so this is this is coming soon to the YouTube channel. I'm going to get a, a hoodie of this as soon as it drops. But uh, the fourth and 31. So this is it. This is the graphic that we're going to go with. Um, so uh, look for this soon. Fourth uh, and 31, a.k.a. the Grave Digger. And uh, excited for that to drop. So you'll see me uh, copping that hoodie pretty soon. Um, all right, Ty. So when you look to these teams side by side, uh, Georgia versus uh, Alabama, let's turn the page right now to the SEC championship game. And by the way, if you guys don't know about Ty Hayes, Ty Hayes is definitely an up and comer on the YouTube channel. You guys have all seen some of these guys blow up over the last couple of years. Um, from, you know, different people who have started their YouTube channel and, and are certainly on the rise. Um, everybody has clearly seen the success that Josh Pate has, has done. And a lot of that is honestly because of talent and hard work. Uh, Ty Hayes is very, very talented. I, I really encourage you guys to go support his YouTube channel um, around the sports table where he talks about college football and various topics. Uh, so definitely um, check him out. We'll put his link in the description box, but it's pretty easy around the sports table. Um, all right, so Ty, when um, you look to uh, these teams side by side, so I got the individual stats, and then I also have the team stats side by side. Uh, talk about what stands out from Alabama, Georgia, the, from the individual stats. Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, Carson Beck, I think people didn't really think he would throw for that many yards, and I think there are a lot of people out there right now that are still like, oh my gosh, he's almost at 3,500 yards. He's had yeah. a really good season. Carson Beck has been really solid for them, but if you look... Outside of that, it's pretty analogous. And with the way Jalen Milrow is playing right now, the threat of his legs, the way he is tearing apart defenses. I mean, this was an Auburn defense that wasn't allowing people to throw the ball on them, and Jalen Milrow dotted them up all mm -hmm. night long. Milrow's playing as well as any quarterback in the nation. So the stats there, all hats off to Beck. He's been unbelievable, but Milrow's playing very well. If we look at running backs, it's fairly equitable right there. Yes, Edwards has more touchdowns, but McClellan doing his thing as G Ski comes in with the ten dollars. Thank you so much for being here with us this morning, G Ski, and a roll tide. 
you look at the wide receivers, Jermaine Burton putting up more numbers than their leading wide receiver. And then you see Bond putting up more than their second. Now, where we see the massive difference is Brock Bowers. And ladies and gentlemen, that will be the catalyst. But this is where I go to the safety position. You have Smith at Georgia, a lot of tackles, four interceptions. You have Downs at Alabama, even more tackles, not as many interceptions, but playing at an unbelievable level. Caleb Downs is going to be key to slowing down Brock Bowers. He and Malachi Moore will talk about that. Outside of this, Kyle, I think there's this inclination for people to think that Georgia is on a totally different level than Alabama this year. Mm -hmm. But when you look at these stats right here, these teams are far more equitable than I think a lot of people realize, which is why Alabama fans, Georgia fans are all so mm -hmm. excited for Saturday. Because yeah. we know this is a Goliath matchup we are about yeah. to see. This is the first college football playoff game. Make no mistake about it. This is the college football national title game. My, I believe so. Right? You might get a, a double dose of it. Um, so, look, I, I think when you look to uh, – we've talked about Alabama stats, you know, all season long, but some things that stand out to me is uh, the safety, Caleb Downs. He's only a freshman, a true freshman, <laughs> has 95 tackles, which is crazy. The next guy is literally Jahar Campbell, who has 61. So, for a freshman to come in and have almost 100 tackles and we're just through, what, 12 games or whatever they played, it's just remarkable. Haven't seen anything like that plain and simple um these two stats stand out to me the most and i think this will be one of the main x factors in determining the outcome of this specific game it has to do with dallas turner and chris broswell as you could see um down at the bottom left you have nine sacks from turner and broswell who has eight sacks so what that says is these guys have an ability to get to the quarterback and on the flip side and we're going to show a graphic in a second that shows you just how difficult it has been to get to george's quarterback carson beck because he's only been sacked i believe 10 times a season so a tremendous challenge for turner and Roswell to get to the quarterback, but I think that will have a monumental effect on this game. We're still waiting for the big play from Kool-Aid. Um, been talking about it all season long. Maybe it comes up in a game like this, right? Taron Arnold has been playing lights out. Five interceptions exceptions on the season with 10 pass breakups um, and the secondary has been tested now a lot of this is going to come down to um, your x factor so you have brock bowers who hasn't played an entire season but he can take over a game just as very well as Jalen jay Miro can watch that auburn game in the second half where he absolutely just completely takes over you played madden you've seen guys on their x factors well he certainly did that he was making one-handed catches you could literally not stop him he is going to get his i don't even have lad mcconkey up here because he doesn't have enough stats He's right behind uh, Jack Saint in terms of yards, but he is going to also be a vertical threat. I'm not necessarily worried about Georgia's vertical threats versus Alabama because Alabama has seen that before. Ole Miss, LSU, Tennessee, Texas, right? They've been beaten over the top, but they've made adjustments. I'm worried about the fact that Brock Bowers is on this team, and I'm sure that Coach Saban is as well. And, um, you know, Kevin Still and uh, T-Rob and those guys in the backfield have – um, a tremendous, uh, you know, task at hand taking on a player like this. I mean, Carson Beck is playing at a tremendously high level. People are talking about Bo Nix, Jaden Daniels, rightfully so, Penix, Jalen Milrow. Carson Beck is playing on fire absolutely right now. Let's take a look at the teams as they fare uh, side by side in terms of, uh, you know, the team st statistics. Ty, what stands out here when you kind of take your opening glance? Well, once again, we talked about it earlier. Um, the thing that really stands out to me instantly is the disparity in offense. And the reason that's the first thing that stands out to me, it's because I want people to kind of throw away that inclination as to where Alabama sits, give Georgia their flowers. Their offense has been fantastic, but Alabama is better than the number 48 overall offense. Do not see that and be disenfranchised into thinking Alabama has yeah. no shot, but mm -hmm. look down here at this red zone offense and red zone defense. Mm -hmm. Alabama has been pretty good in red zone defense. Whereas Georgia they haven't been as good. Mm -hmm. If Alabama can get down to the red zone, they have a lot of weapons. They have a lot of options. Then we look at sacks allowed. Now, mm -hmm. this is something to where Alabama has been better over the previous few weeks. Jalen Milrow has really become better at leaving the pocket, picking his times and escape routes. And the offensive line has been playing a ton better also, I look at this rushing defense, Kyle. Number 23 is compared to number 26. Not a huge disparity there. The rushing offenses are analogous. Once again, man, I think these teams are far more analogous than people are expecting. I think a lot of people are going to look at these offensive stats and the disparity between passing offense, total offense, 
and be disenfranchised into believing Alabama just doesn't have a chance. That couldn't be further from the truth. Yeah, I think you bring up a really good good point because these stats are cumulative, right? But when you look to the way that Alabama's offense has transformed, it would be good to get a graphic of this uh, that had the teams from you know the after, like from week four on. How would they stack up up to that point? You know, I'm sure the defenses would probably be the same, um, if not a little bit better. But the offense would definitely be the same because I think there's been some statistics recently, like the last five games Alabama has played, you know, they've done this and that. But when you look to uh, these collectively, I mean, what jumps off the board to me is uh, the third down conversions. Um, I mean, for Georgia being number two overall in the country, that tells me that this team, again, like you were saying, they're balanced. And so is Alabama. And um, I think that Georgia is going to be able to um, there. You got to have this goal to be able to get, you know, the third and shorts. And how can you do that? And, and even the fourth and ones. I loved Alabama schematics recently when instead of going for the, the tush push uh, that you're starting to sweep it out to your running backs. I, I saw the Eagles do that a couple weeks ago, and I'm glad to see Tommy Reese has added that. That was kind of when uh, it's fourth and one and they pitch it out to uh, Roy Dell Williams. So having that balance and, and being able to play chess against a team that um, is ultra talented. You see that Georgia has more check boxes on the right hand side. This is a really balanced team. And I've said it a million times since Georgia went to a more balanced approach. This team has won national titles. They weren't they weren't going to win when they were just one dimensional kind of three yards in a cloud of dust. Um, they're not that anymore. I mean, this team can throw the football. They can run the football. Uh, Milton, I think, in, in my opinion, I feel that he's the best running back on that team right now. Um, and for Alabama, um, kind of Jace's day to day. Um, and I think he should be fine for Saturday, but you have some very capable backs behind him and Roy Dell Williams, who's done a really good job. And then you also have true freshman uh, Justice Haynes, who everybody who has been excited about. And plus, he's from the state of Georgia. What a storyline that would be if he's able to get some opportunities in this game. But um, before him, you even have Jam Miller, right? I mean, can't forget about him. And then you also have other storylines on this, like Jermaine Burton. Guy used to be a Georgia Bulldog. You have Trez Marshall, who used to be a Georgia Bulldog. Um, so there's so many storylines. What what else stands out to you, uh, Ty, when you look to Alabama versus Georgia? Some other themes that emerge when you look to um, this SEC championship taking place this Saturday. Yeah, when I look at the totality of this game, Kyle, it really comes down to are your X factors going to be able to take advantage of the matchups? Luckily mm -hmm. for Alabama, their X factor has emerged on offense is Jalen Milrow. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 for even Alabama fans out there, do me a favor if you have time, go back and start watching some of this young man's games. Mm. His growth this season has been nothing short of incredible. Yeah. Uh, Tommy Reese has done a fantastic job. I know there's some rumblings about Tommy Reese in connection to another job. I don't think that that's going to happen. I think that the best thing for Tommy Reese is to stay in Tuscaloosa for another year, two <laughs> years, three years, yes. and learn. He's yes. a young guy. 100%. And the Saban stamp next to your name, that means something. Mm -hmm. And you staying and learning from Saban will open up bigger doors. It won't open up smaller doors. Remember that. I, I think the key to this is that Jalen Milrow is different than any other quarterback, mm -hmm. any other player, quite mm -hmm. frankly, mm -hmm. that Georgia has seen. And I think there's a way Alabama can take advantage of some of the aggressive nature of the Georgia defense. Georgia likes to be very aggressive. I think they can get them to over pursue and take advantage of that. Now, the flip side is this. Mm -hmm. How do you stop Brock Bowers? Mm -hmm. Many have tried. Very few have succeeded. Mm -hmm. Very few have Caleb Downs and Malachi Moore, though. Mm -hmm. I am so excited, Kyle, to see that matchup right there. Kevin Steele scheming up how to slow down one of the best chess pieces in all of college football, Brock Bowers. Talk to me about that. What are you expecting to see there? Um, I, I think that uh, you have, you know, Malachi Moore, who who should be up for the task. I mean, you have a very um you know, experienced player at that star position who's going to have his hands full. I mean, I was kind of thinking about this yesterday and a caller brought this up on my show. Um, he said that what if they slide down Taryn Arnold to the star position and bring in Trey Amos at the corner position, right? Um, I don't know, you know, we're in, in kind of figure out who's a better matchup for Brock Bowers. I think the fact that Alabama's secondary has been tested, um, you know, gives me confidence. And the thing is, if you're an Alabama football fan, you haven't had much anxiety on the defensive side, probably last game because it seemed like Auburn was rushing for 500 yards. I mean, 244 yards is just really incredible. 
um, to begin with. But I think when you look to, um, you know, the fact that Alabama, uh, you know, they, they are battle tested. It's just coming up with a game plan to stop this guy. And I don't think you can necessarily stop him. I just think that, you know, trying to contain him and coming up with some ways that you could bracket him and, uh, and make a play. Look, you got to get to the quarterback. I said that a, a bunch of times. I think, honestly, it, the, the bigger storyline might come down to being able to get to Carson Beck as opposed to stopping Brock Bowers. Because as you saw on on the statistics, I mean, you cannot get to this guy all season long. Think about this. They played in 12 games. They've only allowed 10 sacks. That's pretty amazing. So uh, getting to the quarterback is monumental in this game. It might be the biggest difference maker in this entire game. And uh, the good thing for Alabama is I think they have the best pass rushing tandem in college football with Broswell and Dallas Turner. Those are NFL type guys. Dallas Turner's probably going to be what a top 10 pick, if not a top five. And, and Brazil's made him a ton of money coming back. And there's got to be a player on Alabama's defense that makes a big play. And we've all seen that big play mentality from Terry and Arnold. I wouldn't, um, I mean, I think you could honestly say that Terran Arnold's probably played better than Kool-Aid this season. And, and I get it. Not a lot of people are going to Kool-Aid. We have to look at the numbers, but overall from just a playing standpoint, I think, uh, you know, Terry Arnold's played a fantastic season and he's opportunistic, right? He finds, he finds the football. Um, the other thing, Ty, okay. We, we didn't talk about this, but so we have getting to the quarterback, stopping Brock Bowers, Jalen Miro's play. One of the, the, the fourth factors in this game is, special teams play okay so will Riker? okay look get your mind right i don't know what happened in lsu we forget that it's the next play um auburn i get it you're one point away you know we get that okay this game against um georgia there's been field goals missed at that stadium before we can all go back to the times andy Papanasis missed a field goal that would have ended the game you know there, th- this game you can't have any special team lapses i'm talking um, dropping, uh, fumbling punts. You saw how that affected Auburn, a missed field goal. You know, things like that, you have to be able to tighten up on special teams. You can't have a um, a punt that is shanked, right? You can't give Georgia any type of opportunities in this game. And same thing with Georgia. So the, the special teams factor is certainly going to come in large. I was thinking about this as well. Um, and before I get your take on the special teams play, Ty, I've never seen a team with more... Um, you know, touchdowns taken away than this Alabama team. I was thinking about this. Look, Kendrick Law last week, his touchdown call back. Um, Amari Nyblack, his touchdown call back. Taryn Arnold's touchdown uh, rolled out of bounds. And then uh, Will Riker just throw on, you know, the missed field goal. That's 24 points against Auburn. But um, so talk, t- tell me about uh, that, but also talk to me about the special teams. <laughs> That's a wild thought to get into. How many touchdowns have been taken back? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting because Alabama looked like they were about to blow the doors off of Auburn, which I would have loved, right? Now, this is a little bit sweeter because it came on the anniversary of the kick six. And now for the next 10 years, we're going to be talking about the Milrow miracle <laughs> instead of the kick six. They can they can kick that right out of there. But special teams, it's the often forgotten about but ever so important aspect of college football. And I myself am guilty of it, Kyle. You kind of get so in the weeds of talking about the matchups on offense and on defense Mm -hmm. that special teams will just kind of slip the mind. But games are won and lost on the backs of special teams. Mm -hmm. Starting field position. Are you going to muff a punt or a kick? I mean, that's huge. Penalties Mm -hmm. on special teams. You're talking about the difference between starting at the 25, maybe the 35, or if it's on you, you're backed up to your own end zone. This is the type of game that could easily be won or decided by three Mm -hmm. to six points. Mm -hmm. So Reichard has been automatic all year, and I'm hoping that's the Reichard we've seen. But like I've said, like I've said, every every time he misses a field goal, I have this duality in me. Part mm-hmm. of me is like, oh man, he missed. And the other part mm-hmm. of me is like, we're back. We're back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you said that before. <laughs> we can't be beat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So uh, before we break out, uh, Ross Dellinger, um, who does a great job uh, covering college football for Yahoo Sports, uh, he recently tweeted out uh, this graphic, which I think is uh, gives you an idea of what is to come. 
Uh, and this is as of the rankings are today um, or or how he has it shaped up. So basically he says um, within, let me, I think there's some context to this. So he said uh, the format rules for next year, six auto bids, highest ranked conference champs, six at large bids to the next highest ranked teams. And then the top four champ gets buys five through eight hosts on campus. So here's kind of an idea of what uh, a 12 team format would look like. Uh, what's your take on this, uh, Ty, right here? And uh, the, remember, eight, uh, so five, six, seven, and eight would all host games. So there's kind of a look at um, a 12 team playoff. Well, it'd be different. But here's <laughs> the one thing that I think is awesome. And, and I've said I, I like the playoff format as it is because I like the meritocracy of the regular season meaning something. Now, that being said, if the playoff committee is going to be doing what they're doing, we need to expand because you have got to have. Yeah some sort of consistency or bright line so that you know when the season begins, this is what I must do to be in the college football playoff. Having said that, mm -hmm. the thing that I love that this expanded playoff is going to do, look right under that eight versus nine. That game would be in Tuscaloosa, yeah. Alabama. Yeah. yeah, a playoff game in <laughs> Bryant-Denny? Are you kidding me? Sign mm -hmm. me up for that. That's mm -hmm. going to be unbelievable. As far as how this goes, though, Kyle, there's some interesting scenarios you could start playing here mm -hmm. for instance Tulane is a slept on team my friend them taking on Oregon that would be the best <laughs> defense Oregon has seen all season I, oh. I mean that would be a fun game I think people would write Tulane as being yeah. dragged <laughs> that's not a bad team this is going to be fun yeah, I think, uh, yeah, and and look, these are going to be the same things that we talk about next year during this time is why would the SEC have to play the SEC again? Like these are going to be the conversations that we have when we start looking at the brackets because what, what people are going to say next year is, is just like Matthew said, they're going to be like, oh, you're trying to get the eight, the SEC out. Can you imagine if these two teams play in the SEC title game, right? And then somehow they wind up one and eight on the same side of the bracket, you know, so it sets up these type of matchups that you could certainly have. But it's just kind of fun to think about, you know, the the 12 team. And um, I look, it, it's going to happen. So it's not like I mean, it, it's probably going to be better than this formula um, that we have right now. I mean, I just it, it's uh, a disservice, in my opinion, to college football that a group of people uh, get into a room that aren't coaches and, you know, I, I don't know, just random people, you know, that are, are deciding the world of college football and deciding the world of Alabama and deciding the world of Florida state, you know, it's like all this stuff. It just, it doesn't make sense to me. There's no, you imagine if they did this in like the premier league for soccer or in the NFL, right. The, can you imagine the NFL are like, well, I don't think the Eagles are really the number one seed. I mean, I think we might have to go with uh, maybe the Detroit lions, you know, overall, I just think they've had a better, you know, they have more style, you know what I'm saying? It'd be like, it would be crazy. Um, but anyways, with that said, you do have the 49ers taking on the Eagles. Uh, so, you know, I'll be watching that game uh, if I can, because the crazy thing is that is also Saturday night. So um, I, and uh, fam, I will be in Atlanta. So I'm going to be at the game and uh, really excited and looking forward to the SEC title game. Um, Ty, any uh, closing remarks when we look to uh, this uh, SEC title or kind of close out um, the playoff talk? The only thing I can tell y'all is the committee to continues to disappoint me. And I know it should take care of itself. Yeah. Kyle, you and I have said this time and time again because we've had people come in here and say, don't worry about it. Y'all are getting in a tizzy over nothing. Mm -hmm. Somebody's got to point this out. We can't mm -hmm. have a committee doing a bad job for the purpose of doing a bad job up mm -hmm. until the moment where they have to do a good job. Mm -hmm. You should be trying to do a good job every day. Committee's killing me. But other than that... Alabama is peaking at the right time. Yeah. Auburn, that's a rivalry game. Freaky things happen there. Once again, remember that Auburn team rushed for over 200 yards on Georgia. This game coming up, ladies and gentlemen, in my opinion, this is your national championship. Yeah. Alabama, Georgia, two Goliaths going at it. What more could you want? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, this is another opportunity, a great opportunity for both of these teams to showcase uh, just how talented the SEC is. And, and most importantly for Alabama, you know, I, I think you win and you're in. 
And that's the mindset that they've had since they lost. I mean, they've been in an elimination game every step of the way. This team has continued to show resiliency with fight. And uh, they, they've wanted to show that they're a different team and they wanted to continue to prove people wrong. This is an opportunity that Alabama hasn't had in a long time is to kind of let the naysayers know that link mentality. I love it because there's been so many doubters. There's still a lot of people, including the committee, most importantly, that doesn't believe that this Alabama team is a top four team. If you're looking at the top four teams in college football right now, Alabama Alabama certainly won. They have an opportunity to prove it this Saturday. Ty, I appreciate it, man. You do such a great job. Be sure and follow Ty at Around the Sports Table. His YouTube channel, go support him. He has some really good content, and I think we're going to start to have more of Ty right here on our YouTube channel, which is uh, really great because I think he's a really good addition along with Coach Smook, uh, Coach Jarek, and uh, Coach Sean. I mean, all those guys really great in uh, their space and really, really talented. So, Ty, I appreciate you, uh, and thank you very much for joining us. And again, on Thursday night at 6 p.m., Eastern time, you can catch Ty and I back on the Bleacher Report app. So download the Bleacher Report app as we will be talking. Um, what's our topic? Is it how Alabama can beat Georgia, Ty? Is that our topic? I, I think they're going to have us rant about the college football playoff selection. Okay. Which, don't worry, I've got I've got more ammo. I'm I'm ready to go there. <laughs> because, and, because the keys to yeah. Alabama beating Georgia, I'm going to give you the sneak peek right here. Unleash Milrow, turn to monster mode. <laughs> I know. I know. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to a, a little bit more ranting. Indulge me, people. This is the fun I get. We're going to have a great time tomorrow. All right. Good stuff. Thanks, fam. Hit the thumbs up, like, subscribe. Stay tuned for more coverage coming your way on Bama Football on YouTube. Wednesday night, uh, you have the Coaches Show with Coach Schmook, Coach Sean, Coach Jarek right here on Bama Football on YouTube. And more content coming your way right here on Bama Football on YouTube. He's Ty Hayes. I'm Kyle Henderson coming to you from beautiful Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Until next time, talk soon.